Okay, thanks. Good afternoon to people in the room. We have Caroline and Will. And Julie, Laura, and Margaret, and Mona, and Pauline, and Sharon. <laughs> you got the name. Sometimes you get the name, sometimes you don't. Good afternoon. Okay, folks, we're now showing us live on Facebook, so enjoy your Q&A session, and I'll catch up with you later on. Thank you very much, Alan. Well, I'm getting feedback. I think that's a probably gone. That's it, I think. I think it sounds fine. Good afternoon, George. Are you well? I'm fine, thank you. Yes, how are you? This is, I am retired, and this is our last session, you and I, because that's me finishing at the end of this month. Oh, really? You're not going to you're not going to keep on coming back for webinars. No, Robert Robert wants to do them himself, so he's the boss now. So it's a shame because I quite enjoy doing them, but never mind. Um, but I think I'm seeing you in London. Adizo? Uh, no, I'm on call that week actually, so uh, I'll I'll be here, I'm afraid. Oh well, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. As you're doing click meeting and everybody on Facebook. Um, thank you so so much for joining us. <coughs> We've got questions uh, here. We've got nice messages on the screen from Joe and Margaret and Caroline and Mona and States. So we're going to crack on with these questions and see how we go. I think we had a couple of carryovers from last week. So apologies, we don't get through them, which we'll, we'll try um, and we'll carry them over to next week. So for starters, if you don't respond to ours after one year of taking it, would the next treatment set be a liver biopsy, biopsy rather than of OCA? Um, it very much depends on all of the investigations um, after that year's worth of treatment. Um, so if, for example, the ALT, one of the, well, when we look at the liver tests, we're looking really at three main tests, the bilirubin, which causes the jaundice, and that's usually, you know, that, it's, it, that, that's only really raised when the liver disease is fairly advanced. So we can disregard that one for now. The ALT, or alanine transaminase, which is elevated when there's damage to the liver cells, the hepatocytes. And the alkaline phosphatase, which is elevated when there is the cholestasis, meaning the um, problems with flow of bile. If the ALT is very high, uh, that can be indicative of autoimmune overlap, or it could be indicative of fatty liver disease. And under those circumstances, if the ALT was higher than you expect, um, then a liver biopsy might actually be helpful to look for those, uh, those other conditions, those comorbid conditions. Um, and if they're there, then the treatment would be slightly different than a beta colic acid. So, so sometimes a liver biopsy would be called for um, if the blood test hadn't improved after a year's worth of OSO. Uh, but other times it, it isn't called for. So if, for example, the ALT is um, slightly high, but it's uh, proportionate, it's about, the, it's about as elevated as the alkaline phosphatase, then you can probably put it all down to the PBC uh, without invoking autoimmune hepatitis or fatty liver disease and then there would be no reason for the biopsy you could just crack on with the second line treatment and and that second line treatment could be obeticolic acid um, or it could be bezofibrate depending on what the local um, physician or mdt feel so yes and no is the answer <laughs> as it as it often is as it often is thank you george <laughs> Uh, so next, I've been on warfarin. But, but um, Colette, sorry, we didn't get any additional information. No, no, no. Okay. That's okay. All. Yeah. This, whoever wrote this in, if you want to send on some additional information, but please connect us to the question because once we go through them, you know, we lose track. So do connect it to the first question. Um, so next one, I've been on warfarin since March this year, and due to a number of reasons such as COVID and antibiotics, my INR have not stabilized until the last couple of weeks. I started my ERSO just two weeks ago and my INR has dropped the I and there being international normalized ratio. Um, do you know if INRs, I've never heard of INRs before, do you know if INRs are more difficult to stabilize due to PBC or ERSO or perhaps neither have any effect on INRs? Mm. 
Well, <clears throat> um, starting with the PBC, it depends a little bit on the stage of the liver disease. So if the PBC is early, um, then it's very unlikely that the PBC is going to impact on the warfarin metabolism um, and impact on the blood clotting and therefore impact on um, stabilizing the INR, the, interna the um, international normalized ratio. On the other hand, if the PBC is very advanced, if the person is approaching liver failure sort of territory, then the blood clotting might be abnormal anyway because of the liver disease, and that could complicate the treatment with warfarin. But I think it's unlikely that um, that this person is in that situation because I suspect if they had very if he or she had very advanced liver disease and the blood clotting was already abnormal, I suspect that the that the treatment the treating team would not have used warfarin. Mm. They probably would have thought about using something yeah. a bit different. Yeah. So that that's probably not the explanation here. Mm. Um, <clears throat> The ursodeoxycholic Urso acid is not known to have interactions with warfarin, so it seems a little bit unlikely that ursodeoxycholic acid is causing um, problems with the warfarin dosing and achieving a stable INR. Um, and I suspect actually that the person in the question says that, that they were struggling to achieve a stable INR for, for quite some period of time. I suspect it's the same problem as before, rather than a new problem caused by the urso mm -hmm. and it will stabilize eventually it just does take a little bit of time in some people mm -hmm. um, so bear with uh, be patient and the rnr will eventually yeah. settle great has an rnr before we do that so many years there you go now the next question is a bell tongue <laughs> can i safely take cbd or products with pbc I have cirrhosis now, although I think it's early stage. CBD, is this cannabis? Yeah, but this is this is not cannabis itself. This is the CBD oil, so it's an extract from the cannabis plant, which is right. not meant to um, it's not meant to have the sort of um, uh, the psychological effects, if you like. But it has various other potential um, health benefits. Yeah. Um, now, I, this is a slightly difficult. Um, question to answer. So I wasn't sure when I saw this question whether this was being prescribed by somebody, Yeah. Um, in which case it might be being given in fairly large doses, pharmacological doses, or whether it's self-medication CBD oil that you might buy from Holland and Barrett or other similar organizations, other similar health stores. Um, if it's prescribed, then I think really the person asking the question probably needs to speak to the person who wants to prescribe it. Um, and that person probably needs to check with the hepatologist and between them they can decide whether this is likely to be safe uh, because the hepatologist obviously is, is going to know a little bit more about the, the mm -hmm. stage of the liver disease and the state of the liver and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and the person prescribing it will know the indication for the prescription. If it's self-medication, well, then it's likely to be a low dose. Um, the dose is relatively low in the extracts that you can buy from health uh, stores. And that's probably safe based on what I could find in the literature. That's probably safe. Um, but I don't think any of these things can ever be taken for granted, actually. Every, every drug is a, is, a, is a toxin to the body. It's something that isn't ordinarily there. Um, and we usually only use, in, in general, we will only use a medication um, when we have to. You know, um, medications are not generally taken for no reason at all. Um, and therefore, there needs to be a balance between the benefits, the potential benefits and the potential risks. So mm -hmm. I, I think, unfortunately, this person probably needs to go back to their physician, mm -hmm. um, the hepatologist who knows their liver. Mm -hmm. um, and that individual can say, yep, yeah, it's likely to be safe, but we'll do some extra monitoring just to be sure. Mm -hmm. Or no, this is probably not sensible because. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've got a feeling that James Newberger wrote an article for the Bare, Bare Facts maybe two, three, four years ago. So it's worth um, whoever asked this question going on our website and look at previous articles and see if you can find something there also, which may, you might find yeah. out. George yeah. is Point. Yeah. Just some just just some general comments though. Um, some very yeah. general comments related to this. I mean, I think the person has done the right thing um, in asking the question yes. because um, 
it's just that we can't really answer the question because we don't have all of the other information that uh, his or her doctor will have available. Um, I think in general, if you've got a liver condition, it's always worth thinking, well, will a new medication affect um, the PVC um, or the cirrhosis or whatever else? Um, it might do. And therefore, it is worth just running that past um, past the hepatologist the next time you see him or her. Yeah. Um, and most 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 supplements are perfectly fine, um, but it is always worth asking the question. Yeah. yeah. Because as I say, we shouldn't ever take it for granted that a health supplement is fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the next question, um, before I ask the question, is in relation to semaglutide. I'm not very good at. Um, Pronounce these things. Can you just tell us what semaglutide is, and then I'll read out the question, please, George. Well, it's yeah, it's mainly used as an anti-diabetic medication, actually. Um, although it does, right, okay. yeah, although it improves weight, as it has done in this person's um, um, case, and um, and therefore it's, um, it's it's especially useful for the treatment of type two diabetes. Well, it's only right. used for the treatment of type two diabetes, right. but especially useful where that's been caused by um, by being overweight. Okay, yeah. so the question is, this person has taken this medication before going on to her, so despite losing 20 pounds, great, my liver function tests were higher than normal, may have been a coincidence, but I stopped it when I started taking her, so as I'm being reviewed next month to ensure the medication is working, I don't want anything else to skew the triggers. Can you tell me if semaglutide is likely to have any indications taking it with her, so? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I think I think the person asking the question probably meant interactions with also. Yes. Um, yeah. And I looked that up in the the British National Formulary, which is the the standard text that we turn to to address this kind of question. And there are no known interactions with also. So that's good. Of course, you can never say never, but it no. means that if there are interactions, they're so rare that they haven't actually been documented. Um, so I think we can safely say that it is fine to take a semaglutide with ursodeoxycholic acid. Um, <clears throat> but then that then made me, you know, I looked at the rest of the question and there were certain bits that I didn't quite understand actually. Yeah. Um, so the comment about despite weight loss, the liver tests were higher than normal mm -hmm. might have been a coincidence. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't quite get that because yeah. presumably the reason Urso has been recommended is because there's a diagnosis of PBC. Yeah. So here the most likely explanation for the elevated liver tests is the PBC. Mm -hmm. And there's really no reason to be blaming the elevated liver tests on the semaglutide. Um, okay. So that's 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 one point to, to make. Yeah. The other thing, of course, is that um, is that semaglutide is used for the treatment of diabetes. Diabetes often occurs in people who are over, type 2 diabetes often occurs when people are overweight. And people who are overweight often have fatty liver disease. So those those three things often go together. Mm -hmm. And fatty liver disease could also have been the explanation for the abnormal liver tests, yeah, rather, yeah. rather than the yeah. semaglutide. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite keen that whoever asked this question doesn't blame the semaglutide. Mm -hmm. I did look up actually whether uh, <laughs> semaglutide is known to cause mm -hmm. A drug-induced liver injury, yeah. um, and it doesn't actually. There's no, there is no evidence of all at all, based yeah. on the studies that have been done, that semaglutide does uh, cause a liver injury. In fact, if anything, it seems to improve the liver it function, it, yeah. probably because it's addressing all of those other things, like you know, improving the diabetes and so on. So, yeah. um, so I think I think this person should feel confident to take mm -hmm. the semaglutide. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and they shouldn't be worried about that inter the potential interaction with Urso because yes. there is no documented interaction. It's Joe Dickens. Thanks, that makes sense. So, sorry for being big. <laughs> so there, yeah, that was Joe. And also, too, don't forget, people, as I keep saying to you, that one of the most underused disciplines, medical disciplines in this country, are pharmacists, and it's it's always worth making me appointment with your local pharmacist to have a chat about interaction that with drugs. That is very true, actually. That is very yeah. true. They would have been able to provide that reassurance as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, this question has come up quite a few times, and I'm afraid you may not have 
an answer for you, but David Jones has dealt with this on two or three occasions. So the question is, can you advise whether toric deoxycalic acid has similar effects or so? I read that it is a taurine conjugate of you, Urso, though not sure what that term means, and has many health benefits. I'm wondering if Urso has any health benefits other than the obvious related to BBC. <laughs> mm. um, yes, so they are similar. I mean, Toro Urso deoxycholic acid, or Tudka, is very similar to Urso deoxycholic acid. Um, it's just a, a side chain which makes the difference. Um, and they do, in fact, have very similar effects um, in terms of what they do to the liver, improving the flow of the bile, altering the composition of the bile. Um, there were, in fact, some very early studies comparing uh, toro urso deoxycholic acid to urso deoxycholic acid for the treatment of PBC. Mm -hmm. um, and it was found that actually urso was better tolerated mm -hmm. and also slightly more effective at improving the liver tests. And so we stuck. And so we stuck with those. But um, but they are they are similar um, compounds. In terms of the other health benefits, well, the known health benefits for urso and therefore also for um, toro urso deoxycholic acid is mainly in the treatment of cholestatic liver disease, definitely for PBC, um, but also I mean other effects of urso would be dissolving gallstones, dissolving sludge, biliary sludge. It may be effective for treatment of PSC, jury still out on that one. It is effective for the treatment of um, the cholestasis of pregnancy, mm. um, but all liver related, really. Mm. The other potential health benefits that some people will read about, those are all slightly more tenuous. There's not a, a huge amount of evidence, but for example, it has been suggested that taurosodeoxycholic acid and indeed urso might be beneficial, for example, for the treatment of Park, well, treatment prevention of Parkinson's disease and so on. But that's that's all much more tenuous, actually. There's there's the, mm -hmm. the evidence base for that is is not strong. And, um, and it's all a bit speculative, so I think we would, we would probably put that one to one side and yeah. stick with the liver, yeah. um, the liver indications. Absolutely. With Parkinson's, a very, very complex condition, mm. and uh, yeah, it, it's yeah. not pleasant. Okay, yeah. so next one. I have the M2 PPC indicator, and I'm interested in going on hormone replacement therapy for reasons of osteoporosis. Is there any information or thoughts you can give regarding this? But before I ask you to answer that, um, George, I would say to this person, I don't know if you've had a, a DEXA scan because people with PBC do get regular DEXA scans to check their bones. But also, I know many, many people with PBC um, given HRT patches. Um, but again, it's a very individual thing. But I'd like your thoughts on that, um, George, please. Yeah. Um, well, let's start with the specific question and then let's address yeah. a couple more general things. Yeah. Um, in terms of the specific one, if if the osteoporosis has been confirmed, as you say, mm -hmm. based on a FRAC score followed by a DEXA scan mm -hmm. or, or possibly even by a previous bone fracture, sometimes you don't need the DEXA scan if somebody's had a fragility fracture, meaning that they've broken a bone with very little trauma. Mm -hmm. If that's the basis of the diagnosis of osteoporosis, then I did wonder where the decision to use hormone replacement therapy as the first line treatment has come from. Yeah. Because actually the current guidelines, the current UK guidelines from the National Osteoporosis Guideline Group still suggest that the first line treatment should be with a medication known as a bisphosphonate, mm -hmm. uh, which helps to prevent the breakdown of the bone. Mm -hmm. And they're very effective. The reason that's first line treatment is because it's extremely effective. Um, <clears throat> probably more effective, in fact, than the hormone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure if, if the person, if I was looking after this person, I don't think I would be recommending hormone replacement therapy as first line treatment. I'd be yeah, recommending yeah. the bisphosphonate as usual. Mm -hmm. But it does, the, the, um, um, the osteoporosis group do say that if, um, if for some reason the bisphosphonates, bisphosphonates are not tolerated or Mm -hmm. um, or are inappropriate if they're unsuitable, then yes, hormone replacement therapy is a is a you know is a consideration mm -hmm. amongst many other treatments actually. 
Can I add on to this? You know, we're always looking, people with PBC and any condition, how to help ourselves. My last spectral scan, I don't know, was three, four years ago, I can't remember. But I was surprised this time they gave me a five, six page form to fill in the questions I answered about my diet and exercise. Mm. I was really surprised what they had to say to me about diet because I thought it was how good your bones were, all to do what you ate as a child and when your bones were formed and growing and all this. But, but no, apparently I wasn't taking enough by way of milk products. So I'm not a fan. Um, so she gave me advice, eat an extra slice of bread or what have you. So the point I'm making is be aware your diet will play um, a, a, a part in how your bones are. And you can easily look online on what has uh, calcium and, and et cetera, and what's good uh, for people who have any inklings of osteoporosis. But do remember your diet is still mm. important, even though we're all ancient, you know? Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I, I completely agree with that, actually. So, yeah. the um, um, it, you know, osteoporosis, preventing osteoporosis, keeping your bones strong. Firstly, that's not just important for people with PVC. That's important for all of us. Mm -hmm. And we should all be thinking about it um, at every age. Uh, and it's certainly not just about medications, actually. It mm -hmm. is exactly as you say. It's about diet and exercise. Now, you've, mm -hmm. you've emphasized diet. Yes, I completely agree. But just as important, maybe even more important, is the exercise. And it's um, weight-bearing exercise, isn't it? It's not... Correct. Swimming. Correct, yeah. Yeah. Uh, weight-bearing. So going swimming, unfortunately, won't help, but, uh, but going for a walk would for example and um and there are many other exercises there is in fact uh, the nhs has a website or web page um on the sorts of exercises that people should do to strengthen their bones and they offer different um there are different exercises for different age groups so mm -hmm. i i think everyone should really think about their bones look after them and the best way to do that as you say is diet and exercise yeah i might just take a look at that and maybe nick that and get it in the beer facts because i find the nhs sites the best in the world i really do and i'm delighted to hear that they're giving examples of exercise for different age groups so i think we'll maybe home in on that because it's really important really really important because we you know a large uh, group of our membership are postmenopausal women who are that be vulnerable anyway so yeah I'll, I'll have a look at that george and <laughs> the short time i've got left for the foundation yeah um, um, yeah, so that's um, so that's now now just following on on about the bone health for a little bit. <clears throat> it is relevant. Um, so as you say, many you know ninety percent of patients with PBC are are women. Um, the the average age of diagnosis is you know in the sort of postmenopausal time frame. Um, so this is a group of people who are already at risk of osteoporosis, mm -hmm. and um, and then of course add in the effect of the PPC, the effect of the cholestasis, and so on, and the risk goes up even higher. So bone health is really important for people with PBC, mm -hmm. and um, and the guidelines, the PBC guidelines, suggest that we should be thinking about um, the risk um, or evaluating the risk of a fragility fracture at least every five years okay it doesn't have to be a dex scan every five years there are other ways to calculate the likelihood yeah. of, of having an osteoporotic fracture but really the um the physician looking after your pbc should be thinking about fragility fractures at least every five years and writing down his or her thoughts um uh, because without doing that, of course, you don't sort of, you don't, uh, you know, identify the risk in time. You don't get people onto the correct treatments in time and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So um, if people haven't been asked about their bones and their vitamin D and their calcium mm -hmm. and all the rest of it, if they haven't been having DEXA scans, then that's something that they can ask for. Yeah. Okay. And this person said, it must be the same person on the screen, I'm interested in HRT for osteoporosis, but also other menopausal symptoms which yeah I, I would I, I would really i would treat them separately personally yeah. um, i would treat them as separate um separate things mm -hmm. <clears throat> um hrt of course has been in the media recently uh, because of the shortage of hrt um and uh, the you know the appreciation because of that of the importance of hrt to alleviate the symptoms of menopause and of course it undoubtedly does that it is a very important medication for many many mm -hmm. women um I, I wasn't in complete agreement. I mean, I think I think in the media there was a suggestion that HRT actually should become an over-the-counter 
um, treatment. Mm -hmm. I wasn't absolutely convinced by that actually, because HRD does carry certain, it does increase the risk of certain things. So it increases the risk of a deep vein thrombosis, for example. Um, depending on when it started, it might increase the risk of heart disease. It increases the risk of stroke. It increases the risk of certain cancers. Um, so I, I don't think that HRT should be an over-the-counter medication. I think it is worth having the discussion with the GP mm -hmm. to decide whether it is going to benefit yeah, you yeah. or whether yeah. it simply yeah. increases risks with no additional benefit and then mm -hmm. making an informed decision. That, absolutely. That's the key is an informed decision. So I think so. I think so. And, and for many people, it, you know, the symptoms of the menopause are so bad that actually the HRT is great. You know, it makes yeah. life much, much better, in yeah. which case go for it. Yeah. But if the symptoms of the menopause are, are mild or non-existent, then mm -hmm. the HRT isn't really adding anything, but mm -hmm. it might be increasing risk. So I, I really would treat HRT and for, for and menopause as being completely separate from management of osteoporosis. And I would stick with the, the standard guidelines for the osteoporosis, which is bisphosphonates. Yeah, no, good advice. Okay, so moving on, does taking 200 milligrams of B12 long-term affect the liver? I've heard B12 injections are even better. We should know if this is correct. Is it true that some people, even though they have the full blood count of B12, and not absorbing it so the injections are good for them. I have to tell you, my, my dog gets vitamin B12 injections. <laughs> but okay. our cat, she's been fine for about a year. <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I fully understood this question actually. Um, yeah. <clears throat> a, a daily supplement of B12 is unlikely to affect the liver because the excess will actually be just be um, lost in the urine. There are some, I mean, B12 can, if you, if you inject large amounts of it, it can lead to toxicity because it has to go somewhere temporarily and it'll sit in the liver and so on um, until you've managed to excrete it all. <clears throat> but taking a daily supplement, a tablet supplement and so on is not going to cause that particular problem. B12 injections really are only for people who can't absorb the B12, but if the B12 is measurable in the bloodstream, then it is being absorbed. Mm -hmm. So there is no reason if the B12 is, is measurable and it is a, it's at a, re, a, a normal level in the bloodstream, then I can't see any reason for the injection at all, actually. Yeah, 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 sure. Okay. Right, I am 63 and a little weight has crept on during COVID. Here all day. I recently developed high blood pressure but never had this before. Can this be related to PVC? No. Okay. <laughs> well, no. Okay, but but we can we can use the question uh, to to think about other uh, certain other things. So, firstly, um, URSO causes weight gain. Of course. <laughs> Thank you for being honest. I'm so glad to to deny it. Thank you, George. No, no, it does. It does. It it certainly does. Um, but it's not usually very much. Um, a few kilograms, yes, and then it stabilizes. So it's it's not the sort of weight gain that keeps on going and going and going. No, now, it no. could it could be that this person actually started their OSO during the lockdown as well, in which case maybe the PBC via the OSO has contributed to the weight gain and the weight gain in turn has contributed to the blood pressure. Mm -hmm. But um, but if that isn't the case, then then I think it's very unlikely that the PBC or the treatment of the PBC has contributed to the blood pressure. And it's much more likely that the reason the blood pressure is higher now is because of the weight um, and also because blood pre high blood pressure is more common as we get older. Um, so it could be that combination of things. And the ways to, to address it is going to be less about the PBC and more about the, the healthy diet, no added salt diet, for example, the exercise, reduction in um, alcohol or cutting alcohol out completely and losing the weight uh, that will all help with the uh, with the blood pressure yeah okay um i have pbc and autoimmune hepatitis would you know is it safe to try a weight loss drug called ozem <coughs> yeah so I, I didn't know this trade name actually but i looked it up and it's semaglutide again um but i'll just quickly make sure of that well while you're doing that it says here i have no gastro specialist to ask at present and my doctor is interested in another opinion. 
Yes, I'm no, not it is. Sure that, I'm Sorry. not sure that, that this person, I think, shouldn't all PPC be seen by a specialist? Um, it, uh, well, gastro, uh, yeah, well, let's define, well, we'll answer the question first and then come back to yeah. that. So, yes, I, I have, I've just checked again for a second time and Azempic is semaglutide. Mm -hmm. So, as we said before, um, semaglutide should be safe in PBC. Um, when I looked it up, there's no reports of drug-induced liver injury caused by mm -hmm. semaglutide. So, it should be absolutely fine, actually. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> as for... PBC being looked after by specialists. I, I mean, I broadly agree. There are some occasions when we suggest that um, that the GP can take over, um, but that will be quite selected cases. So, so for example, a person who has very well controlled PBC, but for various other reasons is struggling to get up to the hospital, and that does happen. Um, under those circumstances, you might suggest that the GP takes over. But other than that, I would agree, actually, most, um, almost all PBC patients should be under follow-up by a gastroenterologist or a hepatologist, yeah. ideally a hepatologist. Even it may be if it's just once a year, once every it might, year. Exactly, it might be once a year, it might be once every couple yeah. of years. But I, yeah. I, think, uh, I think really most, most patients would benefit from that hepatology input. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I, so actually, this, uh, I mean, yes, semaglutide should be fine. But actually, why doesn't the doctor, instead of asking in a, for another opinion about semaglutide, why doesn't the uh, the doctor ask <laughs> for, for a hepatology referral? <laughs> Absolutely, go for it. You heard it here, right? This, I know this lady's in America. It's contact. This next question here. I was diagnosed with PBC six years ago. The doctor told me I'd early stages. At the time, my liver enzymes were high and I had the AMA marker. I had a liver biopsy, which came back fine. Since then, my liver enzymes have been normal. So my question is, do I have PBC or not? Doctors said I don't have it, but make sure I keep up with my labs every year. What are your thoughts? And thank you for all the time, all your time and being here today. So, Does, is, is what... Okay, I might have missed something. Did the person, did the person asking the question actually start treatment with, for example, ursodeoxycholic acid, which would be? She, she doesn't say, but I know she's in the room, so maybe she can tell us. But what I can tell you about this uh, lovely lady, she's lost masses of weight. Oh, uh, okay. Massive amounts of weight, so that would make a, a, a <coughs> difference in enzymes. But she, she has the AMA marker. Mm, okay. Okay. Well. Okay. That 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 may fit then. Yeah. Um, if the the liver tests were abnormal at one point, and presumably that's what prompted the investigations, which identified the antimitochondrial antibody. Mm -hmm. From what you're saying, Colette, it it sounds as though there was then some weight loss, mm -hmm. but no treatment. I think the person has yeah. just um, yeah. has just written down that there was no no. Medication. She just said yeah. And the liver test returned to normal. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, I would agree with her physician, actually, mm -hmm. that quite possibly the reason the liver test returned to normal is because of the weight loss. In which case, that's fantastic. Keep oh, the weight yeah. up, keep the weight off. That's great. Um, and if the liver tests are now normal without any treatment, I, I agree with the physician. No, there is, we, she doesn't have PBC by definition. But, but there is still a risk that, that the PBC will emerge in time, and therefore it is important to keep monitoring the liver tests. Yeah. Uh, because when the PBC emerges, it'll show itself, it'll reveal itself with abnormal yeah. liver tests, and that would be the time to get onto some medication to prevent the PBC from progressing. Yeah, and that, yeah. So, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. I have PBC and AIH and take 75 milligrams of acetipine and addition to so. Just before we get on to that, sorry. So can right. I just say to Mona, it is really, really important to get those annual blood tests. Yeah. yeah. Don't 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 forget at any point. Okay. Yeah. It's it's really important to keep up that monitoring. Okay. Um, so this person with AIH on acetipine, normal LFTs, a last fiber scan 13. I've been classed as clinically extremely vulnerable and I've had three primary doses of the COVID vaccine, then a booster at the end of January. 
Last week, I had a message from the NHS to say I'm eligible for a spring booster. Do I need a fifth dose at this time, or might it be a mistake? Well, I, I work for the NHS, so the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you must have your spring booster. Um, yeah, I know I'm going to toe the party line on that one, actually. Um, I can't think of any reason not to have it. Um, sorry, but just to get the, the facts absolutely clear in my head, this is autoimmune overlap. Yeah. 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 And the person is therefore taking both ursodoxcholic acid and some form of immunosuppression. 75 grams of um, azathioprine. Azathioprine, yes. Okay. Um, and then the person has background liver disease. Yeah. Now, I, I think this person is vulnerable to um, COVID, um, severe COVID, and therefore should take um, uh, take all should try to mitigate that risk um, in any way possible. So I, I would advocate the um, the spring booster, actually. OK. Can I, can I also add uh, that I was sent a letter, I, don't, I can't remember when, sometimes it went after my uh, booster, to say that as I had the COVID disease and was vulnerable, if I did have COVID, I was to take a PCR test and I was to contact uh, you know, the NHS within five days. Now, this I did, um, and they offered me uh, an antiviral. Now, A, I wasn't ill with COVID. I wouldn't have known I had it if my husband hadn't you know, shown such severe symptoms. I was just a bit tired. And B, and this is the thing what people need to be aware of if you're taking blood pressure medication, it's a different package, it's a different scenario. So if you do catch COVID, make sure somebody knows about it right away because you've only got five days for these antivirals and if you are taking blood pressure tablets then please make uh, the answer for the doctor um, know about that but they are there which is just a wee extra thing it's nice to, to have isn't it i yeah I, i've been really really impressed actually i mean i, I know we there are so many problems in the NHS at the moment related to waiting lists and catching up with um, with all the time that was lost during the COVID pandemic. Yeah. Um, but actually, one of the things, one of the many things that the NHS has done incredibly well is setting up exactly what you're describing, which is these COVID medicine delivery units, whereby um, people who need the treatment with antivirals um, phone up, they're triaged by an expert Mm -hmm. who asks them all the relevant questions, works out whether they need the antiviral treatment and works out on the basis of their various other conditions and treatments, which antiviral treatment would be most appropriate to them mm -hmm. for them. And uh, it, it, the, the, that system was set up very rapidly. Um, mm -hmm. A few of my patients have had to have, have needed antiviral medication and have received it very efficiently. So I'm, I'm incredibly impressed by that, actually. Yes, I am, because initially it was a pharmacist who phoned me from the Western General in Edinburgh, and she was just a bit, she'd never heard of Russell Doctor Colic acid before. Uh, she couldn't pronounce it anyway. And she was just a bit unsure, and within an hour, the consultant, infectious diseases consultant, phoned me, said, you need to make an informed decision. Let's go through it. And he said, what are you doing at the moment? I said, I'm walking the dog. He said, you're not really unwell. Oh, yes, no. So it was nice that that mm. was there to look at my individual mm. circumstances, which yeah. I was very impressed with. I agree with you, George. They, they, these doctors are not bad people. Some of them. No, I'm not a doctor basher. Right, so I have a serum folate level of three. A GP has prescribed me five milligrams of folic acid for three months. Is this part of PBC? Um, no, no, I wouldn't blame that on PBC. Um, I mean, there are related autoimmune conditions that can lead to a low folate. Celiac disease, for example, could lead to a low folate, uh, but PBC shouldn't. Um, it sure. might just be, it might be as simple as uh, a diet which is not sufficiently um, full of vegetables yeah. um, and the folate replacement will probably do the job. If the person remains folate deficient, they might need to, to think um, yeah. to cast the net a little wider. If, if this person is deficient in vegetables and you don't like vegetables, soup suits the answer. Loads of recipes online, BBC do well, pinch of nom, cookbooks, soup. Get your beds that way. Um, 
So this person, I have never heard this before. Of course, it's been uh, interesting today. I've just started doing rebound therapy on a trampoline. I'm age 53, just diagnosed this year. Will this be a beneficial kind of exercise? What's rebound therapy? Well, I, I'm going to have to look it up, actually. So I can't really comment on whether it's beneficial <laughs> or not. I don't know what yeah. rebound exercise is. Well, while you're talking, while you're having a look, um, the trampoline, um, um, you have my respect because most uh, ladies of that age, me included, had a bit bladder problems jumping up and down on the, on the trampoline. So rebound therapy, wow, that's... Uh, and I hope, I hope you're enjoying it. But, uh, I think any kind of exercise is, is beneficial. I really do. Okay, it looks like um, it's it looks like it's just exercise involving a trampoline, basically. Right. Um, in which case, I agree with you. I think that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, what do we need to say in more general terms? I think in more general terms, um, it's going to be reasonably high impact by the looks of it. So I think if anybody else listening in or on on Facebook is thinking about doing this, they probably need to just check um, with the trainer in the gym um, that they are suitable for it. Yeah. Um, most people probably will be, but it's the usual thing. You've got to just uh, go down, go, you know, chat to the personal trainer um, yeah. and explain that you have PBC, whatever other conditions you may or may not have. Do you have osteoporosis, for example, and so on and so forth. And they will be able to decide whether this um, exercise is, is, is suitable for you. Yeah. But and in a general, uh, general comment is that exercise is good. So, uh, yeah. Movement is medicine. Absolutely. I wondered if we, with PBC, should be called for a further COVID booster, as I have not been called. I haven't been called either. Um, hmm. So, if it depends. Um, yeah. the, 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 um, this is updated often, um, and I, you know, so so a full disclosure. I've not actually checked the NHS website on this for a month or so. Um, but the last time I checked, the main um, indications from a liver perspective were cirrhosis mm. um, or immunosuppression. Those are the main considerations. Mm. Many people with PBC, despite the old name, uh, do not in fact have cirrhosis, okay? And PBC is not treated with immunosuppression. So the majority of PBC people, people with PBC, are not going to need um, the booster at this point in time because yeah. they won't actually be that vulnerable. Yeah. That's different to the person that we were talking about before who mm. has autoimmune overlap yeah, and is yeah. taking azathioprine. That person is more vulnerable because of the immunosuppression. Yeah. And then yeah. there will be other people who've got cirrhosis, maybe have liver failure. They're more vulnerable and they need the booster. But mm -hmm. if you don't have those things, if you don't have cirrhosis, if you're not on immunosuppression, then no, you don't need the booster at this point. And it's yeah. absolutely fine for us to wait our turn. Yeah. Great. Um, great. Now, I'm not sure I understand this question, but I'll do my best, George. Can I please ask if a large spleen and ascites are common with PBC? Um, There's more. Well, there's, Let's go there first. Yeah, well, they're not common, um, but having a large spleen and having ascites are indicators of advanced liver disease. Um, so they're not. They, so whilst they're not common in in all patients, they're also not unusual um, in people with liver disease because that is um, that is what end stage liver disease looks like. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be. I'm not sure whether the person's online and can maybe wants to provide a little bit more information. Well, the, yeah, I think so because this person goes on to say also changes in cirrhosis. So it's a sentence on its own, also changes in cirrhosis, question marks. I don't know what, know what that means. Yeah. I don't have cirrhosis as far as I know, but this was mentioned in an MRCP scan result which when I was rushed into hospital. So we're missing a bit of information here. Yeah. Okay. We? Well, all right. I mean, this is, this is now getting a little bit... Um, technical yeah. usually usually um, having a large spleen will happen because a person does have cirrhosis mm -hmm. the blood from the spleen and the blood from the gut um, that has to pass through the liver in order to get into the rest of the get back into the circulation um, so if the liver becomes very scarred 
as it does in cirrhosis, it becomes more difficult for the blood to flow through the liver. The pressure in the portal vein, which drains the spleen and the gut, goes up and the spleen becomes congested with blood. So it grows. And once it's been big for a long period of time, it starts to get a bit fibrotic and so on as well. So it's not unusual for people with cirrhosis to have a big spleen. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually, as the cirrhosis um, uh, uh, progresses, um, in addition to having that increased blood pressure in the portal vein, um, the production of things like albumin and other proteins diminishes. And the combination of having the low albumin, the low protein, plus the portal hypertension results in the formation of the ascites. Okay, so usually this is something that happens in a person who's got advanced liver disease, end stage liver disease. Okay, it can happen, however, it, it is possible to have to not have cirrhosis but have a big spleen in PVC because some people with PVC have what's known as pre sinusoidal portal hypertension. Um, also known as non-serotic portal hypertension. Um, and that's because the PBC affects or can affect, not in everybody, but in some people, it can affect the tiny little blood vessels um, that um, the, the tiny little blood vessels that um, the portal vein branches into. Um, well, any vein is a bit like a tree. OK. Um, and the, the tiny branches are sort of the, are the very small blood vessels that, uh, that a vein branches into, an artery branches into. And, uh, and PBC, and in some people, PBC can affect those tiny little blood vessels, the tiny little branches of the vein. Um, and that can lead to increased pressure in the portal vein and the formation of the big spleen. So it is possible to have to not have cirrhosis and have um, a big spleen, but mm -hmm. most times, usually, um, it is it only happens in cirrhosis. Mm -hmm. Would it surprise you to know I'm quite squeamish and sometimes these descriptions I think, oh geez, oh, oh. <laughs> now I want to ask you something just a wee bit um, separate from liver at the moment. Um, going back to COVID and antibodies. So if one has COVID, I, I expect we'll have been asked, do you produce antibodies? And if you do, for how long? And is it the same antibodies as when you have the vaccine or the booster? Are they different um, antibodies? Uh, when you get COVID, you do produce antibodies. Um, and when you have the vaccine, you also produce antibodies. Mo uh, the answer to, in terms of which antibodies, um, the vaccine only consists of a certain part, a little part of the virus, which is the spike protein. Most of the vaccines only contain the spike protein, which means that you can only produce antibodies against that spike protein. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you get a natural infection, if you're infected by the SARS-CoV-2 virus and, and get COVID disease, um, then of course your body produces um, antibodies against the, all of the virus including ah. so there will be some overlap um some of the, the antibodies produced in a natural infection will in, will will be antibodies against spike protein just like the ones that you produce against the vaccine but then in addition to that there will be many other antibodies against other bits of the virus mm -hmm. um the antibodies remain well we don't know exactly how fast they did they decline but they do appear to decline and the rate of decline seems to render you susceptible to infection again approximately six months later. Okay. And that is the reason for the timing to so far for the timing of the uh, of the boosters. Yeah. Somewhere okay. between three and six months is about right in order to maintain a high level of protection against severe COVID. Mm -hmm. That's and yeah, I kind of heard this. The minister's wife, who gave us COVID, had said there's a there's an app, an NHS app, and it told her that she would. So she had it in March. She'd be fine until September. Hmm. When, I don't know if your antibodies disappear or they just slowly. Um, they don't. They don't disappear completely, but the 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 level does diminish slowly over time. Yeah. Um, we don't know exactly what level of antibody you need in order to have decent protection. Um, and and, uh, and neither do we know very well how rapidly those antibodies deteriorate, um, right. antibody levels deteriorate. 
But um, but based on the evidence so far, we think it's around six months, you know, that, that you have really good protection well, from a good. vaccine. Yeah. It's good to know. And I'll tell you something else, George, since having COVID, and I, like I say, I was always a bit nervous and frightened of it, like everybody. I, I've kind of lost my fear of it now, and I'm going about, and it's just not in my head anymore. It's just not. It's so that I benefits. Um, yeah. But, but I, but I think that's a good thing, by the way. Yeah. Bennett. I mean, I you know the many of the people when you know a, a year ago, two years ago, when all of these webinars started. I mean, we were all ter terrified, and and many of us were sort of you know sitting at home trying to avoid um, mm. contact with anyone, and that was perfectly correct at the time. And the mm. lockdowns were important, and the shielding was important. But um, but now everyone has had one or more vaccines. Mm -hmm. Some people are up to five, as we've just uh, as yeah. we just talked about. Um, in addition to the vaccines, many people will have also had COVID, mm -hmm. would have had the infection, which will have also given them protection. So the majority of people in the UK are pretty reasonably protected against severe disease now. Yeah, yeah. And probably, probably it's right to have your attitude. Mm -hmm. um, and to be a little bit braver about getting out there, doing yeah. some exercise, meeting some friends, yeah. um, you know, having coffee with people, yeah, and and um, and resuming mm -hmm. the sort of life that we had in 2019. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. People mustn't go mad, of course. They must still be careful. No, no. I was wary about going down to the usual conference in London, but I feel mm. confident about it. Yeah. Right. Before I through these questions. So this person says, I'm finding the Sjogren's worse than my PPC. I have noticed terrible stiffness in my stiffness in my joints recently. Could this be <coughs> PPC or Sjogren's or both? Before George answers, I'm going to say to you and to everybody, if you have um, changes from uh, what's normal, if something is persisting, please go and see a doctor. We can get other things apart from PPC and Sjogren's and what have you. But always, if there's a change, chat to your doctor but anyway, mm. uh, well no i i agree actually i yeah. completely agree with that i mean it could be um it, it could be the pbc but uh but equally it could be the sjogren's it could be other um sjogren's can be part of a mixed connective tissue disease for example mm -hmm. yeah. um, it can happen in scleroderma it can happen in sle you know so mm -hmm. so I, I i agree with you actually it probably is time to because of the joint changes it's probably time to involve a rheumatologist mm -hmm. um, and either the gp can make that referral or the hepatologist could potentially make that referral it depends a little bit on what the, the local systems are but um but i think you, if the if the joints are stiff then it's better to see a rheumatologist sooner rather than later mm -hmm. um the Sjogren's can be incredible, as we all know, Sjogren's can be very, very problematic in PPC. Mm -hmm. And it's not unusual, actually, for people to struggle more with the Sjogren's um, mm -hmm. than from the traditional symptoms of PPC, mm -hmm. the itching or the tiredness. Um, and even if the person doesn't have an additional autoimmune condition, the rheumatologist might still be useful, actually, to help treat those symptoms of Sjogren's. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I, I encourage people with uh, with PBC if they're struggling with the dry the symptoms of dry mouth and dry eyes and dry skin mm -hmm. um, and so on speak out you know um, speak out because um, there are treatments available yeah and right. it's much better to get them yeah than Absolutely. just than to sit and suffer. Somebody's saying this is very true. I recently found out. I'm not sure what, but thank you for your comment. Um, some days come in, it's not a question, it's just a statement. I'm, I'm sorry to hear this, and I really wish you a speedy recovery. Currently got COVID the third time, the worst in hospital. Um, currently, my spleen is inflamed and infected. My ammonia went up just now, going back down. I'm really sorry to hear that, but that, that, that must be quite unusual, George. Well, yes and no. Yes and no. So the fact that the spleen is big and the ammonia has gone up, I think that probably tells us that this person has quite advanced liver disease. Ah, right. And that takes us back to what we were saying earlier, <clears throat> that there are two groups in, 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 as far as liver disease is concerned, there are two groups who are particularly at risk, those with cirrhosis, those with advanced liver disease, and those on immunosuppression. And those people should definitely be receiving. So back to that original question, should should people in those categories be receiving the spring booster? Yes, they should, in order to remain protected 
um, from severe COVID. Yeah, 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 that's a good point, Han. Um, so the last question of the day, which is quite a, a good question. Um, hi, is 10 a high score in the fibre scan and does it indicate cirrhosis? Is 10 high on a fibre scan score? Um, <clears throat> No, officially, uh, we would normally consider cirrhosis at around 16 or 17. Um, but there are some other smaller studies suggesting that actually probably levels of 10 do indicate significant scarring. Um, and for that reason, you know, in my, in my practice, yes, I would take 10 um, quite seriously um, and would even consider starting surveillance at that point, the ultrasound surveillance, six monthly scans and so yeah, on. That yeah, yeah. Um, but the fibre scans are, are best taken in context. They're best interpreted in the context of all the other investigations. Mm -hmm. So if the ultrasound scan looks shows a completely normal looking liver and the spleen isn't enlarged and the blood tests look good with, you know, the platelet count is not, um, is yeah, not reduced yeah. and so on, then it may just indicate moderate fibrosis. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, if the ultrasound shows that there's, um, that the liver looks a bit irregular and the spleen is big and the blood test shows that the plate count, the platelet count is down, well then that would suggest that, that, the, that the scarring is fairly advanced and, um, and that should be treated as cirrhosis. So it's worth put, putting it in context of all the other investigations. Okay, well that's all the questions we've had. Thank you so much everybody um, for sending your questions in. We go again uh, next Thursday with Dr. Geish. I'm on holiday next week but I'll if I can get a signal, I'll be coming in doing this. But I would say to everybody, money's going to be really, really tight for everybody. Um, I know we have a cost of living crisis, but that goes for us at the PPC Foundation too. So if anybody can help and donate or put a restanding order in place, I'd be really, really, really grateful because we want the, the foundation continue to continue. We don't get any government funding. We're self-funding, so if you could donate, I'd be very grateful. George, I think this is a bit of a au revoir, really, because this is my last session. Well, so thank you much, Glenn and George Mills. I truly appreciate it and answer my question. Have a great weekend, you. So um, I guess we'll meet at some point, but I don't know when, George, but for, my, for me, I, I mean, you and I have known each other many, many years. I remember you're a very young doctor, and I remember you were starting off in the the DNA uh, trail and, and we met up and I hope we were mutually helpful and we've had a lovely relationship but um, thank you so so much for believing in what I do, what we do I know you're going to stick with the foundation and it's new CEO which is Robert but personal thanks from me are just enormous, I'm feeling a bit overcome <laughs> Yeah and um, um, from me George, I'll still be pestering you for future yeah. sessions Well I, I, found, I found you some new people to pester so <laughs> Um, well, my, my, and, and, the, and the other way around, Kalit, actually, thank you so much for everything you've done for PBC. I know everyone uh, here on, online will be say, thinking and uh, the same thing, but, um, but you've done an enormous amount, actually, an enormous amount um, for all the people with PBC. And really, you've changed the, the way that um, the doctors approach the condition and doctors approach patients. So that's, that's a huge impact, um, which, uh, which, we should, which we're all grateful for. Well, you were all more than welcome. I wouldn't change the thing. I'll be, I'll be hanging around to be well. Not go near the office, but if the office needs help with uh, help when calls and, uh, you know, Robert doesn't know what he doesn't know. So I'm there for, um, you know, a few weeks, maybe a couple of months or so anyway. So we'll see how it goes. But yeah, everybody's more than welcome. I would not have changed the thing. I'm just glad that um, we've come this far. I'm going to ease all to the European Association study the liver and um, our symposium with David Jones and some of the talking about it then and now how it was then and 30 years ago and how it is now and boy we've got a lot to talk about so and there'll be younger doctors there and they'll be looking to us as to what makes good practice so I've got a voice there on that symposium so, so, so that's quite nice so thank you to the background people in the background We've got Jacqueline and Chris is there Alan thank you so so much Thank you, everybody, for your kind, uh, your kindness. Oh, I'm going to wait, George. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Bye we'll for see now. you next week, folks. Three o'clock with Doctor Gish. And thanks very much, George. <laughs> Bye, Great Bye. session. Speak to you Bye. soon, Clive. Okay. Bye. Just now.